good evening good evening i'm privileged to welcome one and all to this international webinar organized by internal quality assurance cell of dokkin kamrup college media today's webinar is the third in the series of four international webinars we are having where resource persons from overseas have joined us from texas san francisco and oklahoma so far we are indeed overwhelmed by the response from the participants not only from different parts of india but from across the globe this digital platform has made it easier for us to connect with you all today we are honored to have two distinguished personalities among us who are alumni of erstwhile cotton college presently cotton university which happens to be my alma mater as well today's digital platform will be shared by dr rakhi kolita moral head center for women studies and associate professor department of english cotton university and her former student dr amita boisho associate professor department of english oklahoma university us take this opportunity to welcome our honorable principal dr nobojiti das who has been a constant support to us and my esteemed colleagues the topic for today's deliberation is very pertinent dr boisho will speak on flag narratives referring to daniel defo and albert camus work and he will also show a clip from world war z during the course of his discussion without much ado i'd like to request principal sir to inaugurate the webinar thank you thank you good evening everyone i on behalf of dokkin kamrup college take the privilege of extending our warm welcome to you all in the digital platform to be a part of the third international webinar of our college in this pandemic period it is in the proud moment for me today that the internal quality assurance cell of our college has come with such a relevant webinar the topic of the webinar is plagues pandemics and literature which is in sync with the pandemic situation that we are all facing now plagues and pandemic have been a very well documented theme in literature several texts written in different time periods give us a glimpse of the difficulties people faced during such crises literature not just deals with the facts and figures related to the plagues but brings down their very human aspect it is essentially a treatment of the human condition and celebration of the human urge to overcome the crisis with these few words on the topic i extend a hearty welcome to our esteemed keynote speaker dr rekha kolita moral and respected research person dr amit arbaisha to give their learned deliberation of the topic i also welcome all the participants once again to this webinar now i am pleased to formally announce that the international webinar on plex pandemic and literature organized by iqsc dk college is inaugurated this evening the 3rd august 2020 thank you very much before i hand over the platform to dr moral for her keynote speech i am honored and excited at the same time to introduce dr rakhi kolita moral head center for women studies and head center for women studies and associate professor of english cotton university to you a phd in american literature on the poetry of t s eliot from guwahati university 
Dr. Moral has been a visiting faculty, Center for Study of Social Systems, GNU, New Delhi, a postdoctoral fellow, Center for Contemporary Studies at Nehru Memorial Museum and Library, New Delhi. Dr. Moral has professional affiliations and collaborations with Humanities Across Borders Program, IIAS, that is International Institute for Asian Studies, Leiden University, Peace Research Institute, Oslo, Norway, European Association for South Asian Studies, Bonn, School of Women's Studies, Jadapur University, Kolkata, Amyokumar Institute for Social Change and Development, to name a few. Recipient of many academic awards, assignments, and honors, Dr. Morrell's research and teaching interest includes modernist literature and arts, war poetry and fiction, postmodernism, feminist movements, feminist history and writings, post-colonial theory, Northeast literature and culture, American literatures, native writings and identity, etc. Madam has made art uh, sorry, pardon me. Madam has many articles, papers, edited volumes, book chapters, book reviews to her credit. Her forthcoming book titled In the Shadow of the Blue Hills, Women Rebels and the Myth of Power is going to be published by Rutledge in 2021. I'm sure I have missed out on many due to time constraints. I wind up now with this brief introduction over to you, ma'am. Thank you, uh, Gargi, uh, Dr. Gargi Chakraborty. And uh, I am uh, extremely privileged and honored to be here today uh, at uh, DK Mirza College on this uh, digital platform. Um, may I uh, convey my respects to Principal Dr. Nopajuti Das uh, for having invited me uh, on this uh, very important forum to discuss what is obviously uh, one of the uh, most relevant issues of our time, sitting in our lockdown situations within the pandemics. It's only very appropriate that we discuss plagues, pandemics, and literature on this uh, forum. Uh, I also extend my greetings to uh, Dr. Amit Rahul Boisha, Associate Professor at Oklahoma University, who also happens to be my student, former student from Cotton College, now Cotton University. So it is a double delight to be with uh, this group of people and uh, as Dr. Gargi already mentioned, to be a little Cotton College club right here amongst ourselves with so many former students and alumni. Um, dear participants, uh, thank you very much for this overwhelming response. I'm told that there are many, many, many registrations and I'm indeed delighted to be part of this. Thank you very much, DK College Mirza and the IQAC coordinator, Dr. Gargi Chakraborty, for taking the initiative to host this wonderful forum today. Um, I will briefly uh, give the participants, give the audience a sort of overview, because uh, I know Dr. Amit will be speaking from a more focused point of view uh, for the simple reason that he has been working along the idea of uh, disease uh, and uh, the idea of uh, plagues, uh, the kind of literature that he has been teaching, obviously makes him uh, very, very competent uh, for this discussion. And I'm sure he has uh, interesting, uh, very interesting focus today in this uh, webinar. I will try and uh, just take uh, you around uh, the globe a bit uh, across uh, both West and East to show how plagues and pandemics 
uh, became a veritable part of life and of uh, imagination because we are here to discuss literature uh, and of course the very interesting documentations as Principal Das has already mentioned that uh, documenting this was so important to various moments in history. And so I go back uh, to uh, this very uh, interesting article that Stephen Greenblatt, a very well-known uh, historian and critic uh, of the present times, uh, talks about in an article uh, where he mentions how Shakespeare actually uh, sort of struggled in the pandemic, in the plague, in the time of the pestilence, and how he sort of, uh, uh, how his imagination was excited by this and what, what is revealed uh, evidently in his writings. So in this recent article, Stephen Greenblatt uh, talks about uh, 1564, and we all know that is the year of Shakespeare's birth, when the vicar of the parish of the Holy Trinity Church recorded the arrival of pestilence in his register. The same year that Shakespeare was born, a few months ago, when a fifth of the population of the village died of the bubonic plague. Now, through his early youth, the plague raged in England, and as several historians and writers have noted, the disease waxed and waned with spells of respite, but invariably would return, uh, with particularly severe outbreaks of plague uh, in 1582, 1592, 93, throughout the 16, early 1600s and between 1609 and 1610. And in fact, this was the moment. Uh, can I have the first slide, please? Uh, is, uh, is the screen available to? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, so the first image, yeah. Uh, so this is the moment, actually a really fecund moment for Shakespeare when he wrote his tragedies like, uh, great tragedies like Macbeth and Antony and Cleopatra, even his last plays, Winter's Tale, um, The Tempest. Uh, please move to the first, uh, the second slide, please. Uh, uh, which is uh, when Shakespeare, uh, no, I'm sorry, the second one, which is, I think, a Shakespeare image, yes. Um, so this is the time that uh, the London playhouses, uh, hist historians write and Greenblatt mentions that this is a period when uh, in so many years, uh, despite Shakespeare's great uh, production, uh, the, the playhouses may not have been, have been open for a total of even nine months. And to have survived through these times of the plague without succumbing to the fearful and relatively unknown disease generated its own associations, its own anathemas. Um, uh, in fact, the plague invested, uh, uh, you know, the language and the literature uh, and the very lives of people with a range of abhorrent semantics, from a curse to an abomination, recalling Shakespeare's very famous a plague on both your houses uh, from Romeo and Juliet that a dying Mercutio hurls on Romeo and Tybalt for not having engaged in duel despite the fact that these were two rival Veronese clans. So English life has been littered at that period with images of the plague devouring people with a plague cart. The plague cart has been uh, in fact one of the most striking uh, images of that time, and uh, heaps of bodies being piled one on the other. Uh, this is perhaps one of the most recurrent images. Um, if I can move to that second image, please. Uh, the third image. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I think we got, yes, the second image, please. No, we, we, we go, go back to the second image, the image of the piles of dead bodies uh, heaped in London. And this actually, uh, uh, you know, brings one very, very uh, potently to the times that we are in. So that, that connection between so many centuries back in time to our own pandemic times, striking exact resemblances of people being moved, perhaps uh, here a little more discreetly, uh, wrapped, uh, 
unavailable to uh, human sight, wrapped in a protective uh, gear, not being able to actually penetrate our lives, kept invisible to a certain extent. But we see, we see virtual images of these, uh, these, these dead bodies, corpses, uh, people who have fallen victim to the pandemic, the present pandemic, uh, creating a similar kind of chaos, fear, panic among people. Now, no single thing actually stands out as clearly as a stroke of fate in bringing the ancient civilization to an end, writes British historian Charles Creighton in the 19th century about the plague which had actually come with the corn ships from Egypt. And that is, that is history, that there was a popular belief that it was the eastern parts of medieval Europe that had allowed these, uh, uh, you know, the trade to actually bring along even pestilence. And uh, Castiglione uh, later uh, uh, notes that the pestilence actually began in interior Asia in around the 14, mid 14th century, arriving in Italy sometime around the 1347. Now the plague spread through Italy and in 1348, Florence alone was supposed to have lost more than 100,000 people. Clearly then, the plague and pestilences became part of the very idiom of human societies in those times. And the ideas of containment, isolation, quarantine were inseparable from existentialist thoughts on life and mortality. And so the body in literature came to be defined as the site of health, happiness, and more importantly, fortune, as much as perhaps it was also the source of despair and utter devastation. Now, a medieval text like Decameron, Boccaccio's Decameron, is probably one of those signature texts coming out of the plague from Italy. And this narrative of this classic that I want to actually point out takes into account not just the complete uh, uh, panic and the devastation of people, but it also looks at the condition of what Boccaccio called the common people, and in great part, the middle class, who did not have wealth, who were only retained, as he says, for the most part, uh, by hope or by poverty in their houses, staying in their own quarters, sickened. And the only way that people actually came to know about those who died was the stench of rotting bodies. And this is what the Decameron actually mentions. It's a description of the plague at Florence, uh, 1348, uh, by Boccaccio. Now, another very interesting uh, figure, uh, Chaucer, invariably 14th century, uh, Geoffrey Chaucer's visits to Florence and Padua a few years later, around this time, also inflected his own accounts of Black Death in the Canterbury Tales. And I, I particularly want to mention this because I think among students and among our, our uh, in, in the Indian universities, at least, uh, we uh, definitely read Canterbury Tales uh, at length. And I quote from the Pardoner's Tale, uh, a particular description of, of how uh, the plague actually stalked people. An unseen thief called death came stalking by, who hereabouts makes all the people die. And with his spear, he drove his heart in two and went his way and made no more ado. He slain a thousand with his spent pestilence and master, ere you come in his presence, it seems to me right necessary to be forewarned of such an adversary, be ready to meet him forevermore. Now, as Dr. Amit uh, uh, Rahul will later illuminate through his own critique of the literature of the pandemic, uh, uh, you know, uh, several different samples of uh, literatures, uh, I do not want to go into a great uh, detail. Uh, but the 18th century, uh, gradually, it's you, the pandemic, the plague persisted, stayed with uh, Europe and uh, different parts of the Eastern world, and came back each time came back uh, and was littered not just by uh, 18th century was littered not just by stories of people and their terrible afflictions, but also lengthy accounts of how the pestilence spread among the people and survived with details of its genesis and pathological conditions. An interest that lasted well into the 20th century and its more sophisticated narratives, uh, Kafka's 1947 classic, uh, almost becoming the forerunner of the pandemic novel. 
uh, and I'm sure you'll hear about it more later in uh, Amit's uh, lecture. The plague, however, was a reason for much writing and as people confronted this terrible alien from alien shores and distant lands, they also took down copious notes for signs and tokens of the disease. So the disease actually preceded its own uh, curiosity about pathological conditions, about medical signs, as much as it inflected, as much as it informed uh, stories of uh, human beings, of romances, of tragedies, while people searched in their bodies for various kinds of evidences of the pestilence, uh, lumps perhaps, blisters maybe, uh, spots, carbuncles, and they begged for prophecies. They begged for uh, all kinds of predictions. They went to clairvoyance uh, in order to understand whether they would be infected by the pestilence. And journal writing at that point of time uh, becomes uh, very, very important. Diary entries become very important and have been a very useful source of plague writing, plague history and its literature. And I, uh, uh, what comes to my mind is Samuel Pepys's diary written in the 17th century, late 17th century between January 1660 and May 1669, which was dominated by accounts of the plague and the year 1666 uh, particularly informed by his anxiety in what was presumably London's worst moment with a fourth of them succumbing to the lethal pestilence. Uh, Defoe's Journal of the Plague Year, as uh, Amit Rahul will also uh, surely um, illuminate us on, matches Pep's own records of that fatal moment and has been regarded in English literature as not merely a dystopic work, but also literature that captures the hard and uncertain lives of people. Now, the absence of actual press and newspapers. <laughs> Ma'am, kindly unmute yourself. So the absence of actual press or newspapers at that point of time, there were pamphlets, but the absence of press made it incumbent on the skills and curiosities of several Englishmen at that point to document the strange illness of the times. Further, it must be noted that the plague lasted for several centuries, coming back in virulent waves and then waning before returning with great fury and potency. In 19th century America, like the older colonial period, the plague was a blight for a relatively new country and community of people who found themselves in a vast and desolate land. So Edgar Allan Poe's dark tales have long and intimate accounts of how the epidemic seized lives and liberties of people in America, in New England. And the plague lingered in the memory. Uh, this is very important that the plague, plague lingers in the memory of early Americans as a frightening Puritan Jeremiad. It instills in the populace the idea of a punishing agent to a wayward community who had traded their deep religious and pious lives for immoral and reckless new ways in a land that had sought wealth and material gifts instead of God's protection. Now, in 1793, yellow fever actually spread all across Philadelphia like an epidemic. And by middle of that November, yellow fever had decimated the city. Uh, after a few years of this, Noah Webster, also of the dictionary fame of the 19th century, a uh, couple of years later, Noah Webster publishes his findings. Uh, he writes and he publishes his findings uh, in a 250-page book called A Collection of Papers on the Subject of Bilious Fevers. So my, the point that I'm trying to make is that a lot of the documentation that was done in the early centuries uh, when the plague actually became part of uh, medieval life and late medieval life, early modernity, was also dedicated to a huge number, uh, a number of tracts which, which actually tried to document the epidemic and the pestilential diseases. And Webster actually followed up his first book with another called A Brief History of the Epidemic and Pestilential Diseases. Um, I think we have uh, 
an image over there. And uh, Webster wrote in 1798, the natural evils that surround us also lay the foundation for the finest feelings of the human heart, compassion and benevolence. Now, 160 years later in America, the contagion of human interference with nature is a subject of another new writing around death and disease. And I just quickly want to um, also refer to uh, the kind of uh, attention that Americans and a lot of the rest of the Western world, including the globe now, all over the globe, um, have focused, the kind of attention that has been focused on what also contaminates, uh, apart from nature, what else contaminates uh, our human lives. And this time, uh, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, 1962, is a book that I'm referring to, is a sharp and timely indictment of a practice in the 60s of America when DDT was sprayed to kill mosquito larva. And she had noticed birds dying in her Long Island home, in her farm, and uh, it led to her wonderful intervention with Silent Spring as her own version of a different sort of pandemic, killing people, killing bird life, uh, threatening human lives and contaminating an entire human society. Uh, this historically led to the environment movement in America and culminated in the creation of the US Environmental Protection Agency and the ban of DDT spraying in America. Um, so, Carson's concept of ecology of the human body was a major departure in our thinking about how human beings coexist with a natural environment. So if plagues and pestilence of one time had been part of the human environment, we also had to deal with other kinds of elements, other kinds of agents that came into human societies. Silent Spring therefore proves that our bodies are not just boundaries. Uh, in fact, a more recent novel by Margaret Atwood, uh, Oryx and Crake, is a speculative fiction that also imagines, that takes forward this imagination to a genetically engineered world in which the last human struggles to exist uh, in a sort of a brave new world. Uh, I suppose. So I also think this kind of literature announces a genre of writing that Amit has been reading closely, the human non human interface and in other ways, how humans have been gradually destroying their own homes and habitats. And I uh, believe his work on the Anthropocene uh, will take this discussion towards another more compelling direction at a later stage uh, that I hope he will deliberate on. In our own literature from a home, Trubajuti Bora's Azar uh, in 2017 is a rich and ethnographic account of Kala Azar, black sickness in the tea gardens around Nogao uh, of late 19th century. Uh, and Dr. Bora writes a medico cultural novel of the epidemic through a vast material history of four generations in a span and the social and emotional repercussions of the disease. Now the political economy of epidemics and the way these were sought to be contained in tea plantations, which, was, which is the subject of uh, Dr. Bora's study uh, in colonial Assam, also generates its, its own kind of rhetoric and local knowledge, giving rise to a form of lore or even rumor and gossip around death and disease. In fact, uh, what is up on your screen is the Milroy Lectures on Kala Azar in 1907 by Dr. Leonard Rogers, a Calcutta-based uh, uh, pathologist at that time, colonial India, who had served in Assam, who came to Assam in the last years of the 19th century, and who stayed on to make a study of the epidemic of malarial fevers, which afflicted thousands of people in the eastern Brahmaputra Valley and how sometimes, in his words, victims of this long raging fatal fever often belonged to lower castes, while upper caste Brahmins from the same surrounding villages managed to escape as they excommunicated the former community by erecting small shelters for those who were affected and left them to die in whatever conditions they were, or sometimes in the middle of rice fields as this interesting tract tells us, without the possibility of human contact. 
So the, uh, the, what we take from this, what we take away from these uh, studies and these literatures was that uh, the institutionalization of vulnerability and destitution has perhaps been one of the grossest sides of the pandemic in human history and a complete bankruptcy of the human in the face of and in fear of death. Um, I think uh, that today's uh, a talk by uh, Dr. Amit will certainly throw light on these interfaces that were probably at a certain point in time missing from earlier literature, but comes now to really to revisit our own understanding of pandemics, of uh, plagues, and of all kinds of pestilences. And uh, uh, I would imagine that uh, new ways of looking at literatures of pandemics and plagues would also be to, uh, to concentrate, to draw from stories of human uh, bondings and human society, how human beings probably have created their own counter narratives. And so at this uh, part, this, this last part of my speech, I would uh, like to actually uh, talk about these counter narratives and in some sense, uh, how these counter -nar narratives probably awaken the human instinct for more abiding, uh, for more abiding kind of uh, relationships, for more abiding kinds and for more permanent uh, uh, relationships amongst human society. As this recent uh, essay um, on uh, the pandemic notes in the March edition of the New Yorker, I would like to end by reading this. And I stress that I would like to end uh, by reading this and uh, uh, to, to, to see how fables, fables of pandemics and plagues uh, are an important part also of our present human society, of our present condition. And uh, this uh, author, Jill Lenore, says, but of course, books are also a salve and a consolation. In the long centuries during which the plague ravaged Europe, the quarantined, if they were lucky to have books, read them. If not, they were well enough, and if they were well enough, they told stories. Now in Giovanni Boccaccio's Decameron from the 14th century, seven women and three men take turns to tell stories for 10 days while hiding from the Black Death. That, that last pestilential mortality, universally hurtful to all that beheld it. A plague so infamous that Boccaccio begged his readers not to put down his book as too hideous to hold. And he said, I desire it may not be so dreadful to you to hinder your further proceeding in reading. And on this note, I would like to suggest that for our immediate moment, in this immediate condition of the pandemic moment, of the pandemic age that we inhabit, perhaps the only way that we as human beings, we as a huge part of human society, can only begin to understand by reading and by having stories to tell, and not by just having stories to tell, but by making stories to tell, as um, a whole lot of our contemporary generation of writers have been doing. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks a lot for your enlightening speech. Actually, last 30 minutes or so has been so informative and it was really, really very lucid. Thank you once again, ma'am. Now, I request Dr. Jilmil Bora, Associate Professor, Department of English, to give an introductory, uh, sorry, to give an introduction to our resource person. Dr. Gargi Chakraborty for giving me the honor to introduce tonight's resource person for the webinar. Dr. Amit R. Boissa, who is presently working as an associate professor in the Department of English at the University of Oklahoma. 
He teaches courses on postcolonial studies, animal studies, cinema, cultural studies, and on special topics like jumbles, dogs, and mutants. He co-edited a collection of essays titled Northeast India, a place of relations, along with Yasmin Saikia. It was published by Cambridge University Press in 2017. His monograph, Contemporary Literature from Northeast India, Death Worlds, Terror, and Survival, was published by Rotelis in 2018. In 2019, Dr. Boisha co-edited another book with Suvadip Sinha entitled Postcolonial Animalities. It was published by Rotelis. Currently, he is busy editing two special issues. The first one is for the Journal of Postcolonial Studies. It is a title, Alter Global Politics, Postcolonial Theory in the Era of the Anthropocene and the Non-Human. He is editing it with Priya Kumar. His second special issue, titled Insights of Sides, Anglophone Literatures from Northeast India, is for the South Asian Review. Dr. Rakhi Kolita Moral is helping him in this issue. Dr. Bursha has also curved a niche for himself in the field of translation. He has successfully translated short stories and novels from Assamese, his mother tongue, to English. Here, mention should be made of his translation of Devendranath Acharya's Assamese novel, Jongom, The Movement. The novel talks of the forgotten long march of Indians from Burma during the Second World War. It was released in May 2018. I once again welcome you, sir, to tonight's webinar on plagues, pandemics, and literature. May I now request you to give your valuable deliberation on the topic. Thank you, and over to you, Dr. Amit R. Bhushya. The digital platform is all yours. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hear you. Okay. Okay, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank everyone for inviting me. Um, DK College Mirza has a special place in my heart. My father who passed away, Dr. Uh, Mr. Dipen Busha, who passed away last year in on August 14th, worked at DK College for 36 years. And in fact, I've kind of grown up around the college in some ways. I've been there for a long, um, I know a lot of people there. And of course, it's been, uh, you know, part of my own personal history in many ways. So it was in, indeed a great honor uh, to say, uh, to, to be invited to speak on plagues, pandemics, and literatures, especially roughly about a year from my, from my father's passing. So I'd like to dedicate this to his memory. I'm also greatly honored that my former teacher, Dr. Rakhi Kulta Moral, had a, uh, gave a wonderful presentation on this and also introduced briefly some aspects of my work. So I'd like to thank, of course, all the organizers, Gargi Baidu, of course, and um, the principal of, of DK College for inviting me. <clears throat> what I'd like to do, of course, is uh, uh, to talk about uh, plague literatures in a slightly different way from a, from a historical standpoint, which Dr. Moral has already given us. Um, and I'd like to begin by briefly talking about how I started getting interested in discourses of plagues and pandemics in literature. As the introduction, my introduction said, I teach a course on zombies. And um, as I was researching to get this material on, on, to teach a class, an entire class on zombies for that matter, um, one of two, two patterns started developing, right? One, which I'll just allude to briefly and I won't talk about too much. And the other one, of course, is going to be the subject of the talk. So when you talk about zombies, you know, the living dead, given that it's such a huge figure, for instance, in popular culture now, if you go back to its history, there are two major sort of uh, frames from where the narrative comes. The first one, of course, is the more Africanist narrative that gets mediated through, through, through let's say, the Caribbean plantation kind of experience and its aftermath, right? So here's Africanist spiritual relig religions like Vudun obviously have a big role. And zombies, for instance, are a big sort of uh, feature in Caribbean literature. So therefore, you can read a lot of novels from the Caribbean 
uh, including probably a novel which many of you may have read, which is White Sargasso Sea by, uh, by Jean Riss. Uh, but even others, like from, from the Francophone areas, like people, uh, novels by Patrick Chamoso, novels by Frank Etienne, which talk about the zombie in its more complex manifestations, right? So that's one way in which it comes out. The other one where I think it, the, the contemporary zombie narrative totally takes a lot from, from some long-standing patterns in literature is the plague narrative itself, right? And the plague narrative, of course, if you think about contemporary zombie films like World War Z which, or World War Z, which I'm, uh, which I'm going to show you a tip from, or George Romero or people like that, or even uh, not, uh, movies, contemporary movies like I Am Legend, a lot of them are actually plague narratives. And I think it plays upon certain tropes of the plague narratives itself. So let me begin with the first one, right? And then I'll go on to Daniel Defoe and then talk about its resonances with Albert Camus and then show you a clip from World War Z and then open it up to questions. The first trope, which was of course mentioned briefly towards the end of Dr. Kulita's talk, uh, is the, the trope of, or the narrative paradigm of the last human on earth, right? And this is an old one. You can go back to antiquity. And my example, of course, would be from a medieval narrative by um, an Irish monk, his name is John Clinn, right? And he wrote in his annals that as people are dying all around him, he fears that he's going to be the last human left on earth, right? The last human left on earth, the last of his species, so to speak. So there's this idea of the last human pretty much witnessing death and destruction going on all around, right? So this tendency, of course, is something that you see percolating down uh, in the later centuries as well. Mary Shelley, the writer of Frankenstein, has this other novel called The Last Man, right? Um, there are other novels in the 18th century, which where the last man sort of narrative paradigm keeps on coming up, which is basically the last human, last of the species, humans have died out, but this last witness sort of tragically or melancholically witnessing, for instance, the death of one species, so to speak, right? And it even comes into contemporary movies. If you watch movies like 28 Days Later, which was made by Danny Boyle, who also made Slumdog Millionaire, uh, the, one of the first scenes is Killian Murphy waking up alone, for instance, in a hospital, right? And as he walks around deserted London, he thinks he's the last of his species. 28 days, he's been in a coma. And then when he comes out, effectively, London has become this sort of ghost town, so to speak, in some way, right? If you watch the popular American series, Walking Dead, it sort of rep replicates the same pattern. So you have Rick Grimes, the police officer in Atlanta, waking up. After he was shot, he was in a coma, pretty much like in 28 days later. But then for a brief while, he thinks that he's the last person on earth, so to speak. So that's the first sort of narrative paradigm that I would like to talk about. Um, of course, here, as I said, I'm using different notions of human collectivity as a distinction, right? Here, I'm talking about the human species, right? As opposed to, let's say, later on, when I'll talk about the notion of humanity as a collective subject, which is a very different notion altogether in terms of the distinction that we can make between species and humanity. So the last human on earth is the first narrative paradigm that I would like to isolate, right? What I'll do, of course, in this talk is to talk specifically about examples, especially because I'm talking about a larger genealogy of the zombie narrative from the plague narrative. I'll talk specifically about more Western examples. Um, Azar has already been mentioned. I think it's a wonderful novel uh, in terms of thinking about the virus as protagonist. And it's, I think, one of the great novels to think about in terms of what we call the Anthropocene or this era where humans have become like a geological agent of the planet. So I think it Dhruvajati Bora's Azar, which I've just recently started thinking about, would be a wonderful text to think in that direction. And hopefully that's something that I'll be doing later on, not necessarily in this talk. But I'll talk about the specific modern features of the plague narrative, not so much about antiquity, not so much about medieval narratives per se. And here I would like to isolate because there are certain peculiar features which come in, the, in terms of modern plague narratives, right? And I'd like to isolate one particular uh, text and I'd like to read that closely in order to think to isolate certain patterns that I think are not there simply in literature, 
But if you go from literature to real life, you can actually see those patterns as well. So I'll be interspersing my analysis with, um, <clears throat> with examples from things that you may have heard around you as the coronavirus rages on, so to speak, right? I'm going to begin scaring my, sheets, my screen. The section that I'm going to read out is from a novel by Daniel Defoe, and that is Journal of the Plague Year. Now, it's written in a mockumentary style, right? In the sense that it seems almost as if he's a witness, right? Uh, the figure who's narrating is a witness of the London Plague. But remember that this was written almost 50 or 60 years after the event, right? So effectively, it's a fictional retelling in documentary style. So in a way, you could say this is also the progenitor of what you would call modern mockumentaries. Okay. Um, so I'm going to read out a certain section from it because I think it sets certain paradigms and isolate uh, certain key issues that come up. This is the beginning, the famous beginning of General of the Plague here. And this is what the narrator says. Hello, sir. Yes. Can you start starting the presentation, can you turn off the annotation option? Sorry, the annotation options. Yes. Okay. Can you turn I'll have to figure out how to do so that. that. There are no disturbance. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I. Uh, Thank you, sir. I'll have to figure out how to do this. Wait, wait a second. Um, do you know how to turn this off? The annotation option. Yes, sir. Go through the uh, screen share menu. Uh huh. Sorry. Go through the uh, screen share menu at the bottom of your meeting screen. Uh huh. Click on the more button. Click on the more button. I'm not sure if there is something called, there's one called share computer sound and optimize screen share for video. At clip. the bottom of your screen tab, allotted to open the annotating tools. I'm sorry, I can't see that. Um, <laughs> okay, okay, you can continue, sir. Okay, if you don't mind. Okay, sir. Can I, can I just go on with this? I mean, it's okay. Oh, yes, I, yes, yes, you can. Yeah, yeah. It says you cannot get while the other participant is sharing. Okay, just a second. Sorry, I mean, I'm not very good with computers. Um, uh, but so let me just go over this first section of the novel, right? And this is what the narrator says. It was about the beginning of September 1664 that I, among the rest of my neighbors, heard in ordinary discourse that the plague was returned again in Holland, for it had been very violent there and particularly at Amsterdam and Rotterdam in the year 1663, whither they say, it was brought some said from Italy, others from the Levant, among some goods which are brought home by their Turkey fleet. Others said it was brought yeah. from India, others from Cyprus. It mattered not from whence it came, but all agreed it was come into Holland again. We had no such things as printed newspapers in those days to spread rumors. Can you hear me now again? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. We had no such things as printed newspapers in those days to spread rumors and reports of things and to improve them by the invention of men as I have lived to see practice since. But such things as these were gathered from the letters of merchants and others who corresponded abroad and from them was handed about by word of mouth only so that things did not spread instantly over the whole nation as they do now. But it seems that the government had a true account of it and several councils were held about ways to prevent its coming over, but all was kept very private. Hence it was that this rumor dried off again and people began to forget it as a thing we were very little concerned in and that we hoped was not true till the latter end of November or the beginning of December 1664, when two men said to be Frenchmen died of the plague in Long Acre or rather at the upper end of Drury Lane. I'd like to isolate certain things here, right? First, please notice the time. It says September 1664, 
uh, a specific marker in calendrical time is mentioned here very clearly, right? 1663, 1664, etc. Right? Then the second thing which he says is that I, among the rest of my neighbors, heard in ordinary discourse that the plague was returned again in Holland, for it had been very violent there, and particularly at Amsterdam and Rotterdam in the year 1663, whither they say it was brought some said from Italy, others from the Levant, among some goods which are brought by their Turkey fleet. Professor Morrell has already talked about how, for instance, in a certain Western imaginary, right, the plague always comes from the East in some ways, right? And I think here's an example of this. The famous uh, thinker Susan Sontag in her book on AIDS once said that one of the peculiar features of the plague narrative is that it always comes from elsewhere, right? It never comes from here. It always comes from elsewhere, right? I mean, you can think of this in terms of H1N1. It said it's come from China, Ebola. It's supposed to come from, from Africa and so on. So the, the idea of the plague always coming from elsewhere, right? So this idea of the foreign origin of the plague, this is the second theme that I'm going to talk about. Then he goes on to say, we had no such thing as printed newspapers in those days to spread rumors and reports of things and to improve them by the invention of men, as I've lived to see practice since, right? And then he says, of course, it, the, the information came through letters and word of mouth only so that things did not spread instantly over the whole nation as they do now. This is a key passage. And one of the things, of course, that I talk about plagues and also zombie narratives is that they are also simultaneously narratives of the media, so to speak, right? So effectively here, in this, in, in this period of early print capitalism, in this period of incipient capitalism, if you may put it that way, we already see the reference to a major sort of media form, which is the newspaper. Although, as you notice, there's a distinction here between the then and the now. He said, we had no such things as printed newspapers in those days to spread rumors and reports of things. Newspapers now spread what you would call information like a wildfire, right? So it's, it leads to a tremendous degree of space-time compression. So in a certain way, again, there's a reference, first of all, to the question of the media. Right? So there's this notion of the media, as I said, this is a proposition that I'll be pl placing in this talk, that when you talk about plague narratives and its contemporary avatar zombie narratives for that matter, they are narratives of the media. If you read them in succession, you can almost do an archeology span of the media, so to speak, in some ways. So this is key. The other thing, of course, which I would like to highlight here is the word rumor, right? Some element of that is already there in the first paragraph where he said, where it was brought some said from Italy, others from the Levant, among goods and so on. So this notion of the rumor as a speech act and how in some sense it almost goes viral. And here we'll come to contemporary media and viral news and fake news and stuff like that as well. So this notion of rumor and the affect or the emotion which is often in some ways you know, associated with what you call the plague narrative, which is the affect of panic, right? This idea, panic comes from the Greek word panikos, which effectively means movement. So one of the things, of course, you will notice is this notion both of terror and movement, so to speak, of people moving, so to speak, in some ways, never staying in place in some ways. And rumors also are a peculiarly mobile form of what we can call information sharing, so to speak, in some ways, right? So that's one part of it. The final part, of course, that I would like to sort of isolate here is that the government had a true account of it and several councils were held about ways to prevent its coming over. All of this was kept very private, right? And then there is a certain ebb and flow of information. Initially, it comes up, dies out. Initially, then it comes up again, it dies out and so on and so forth. Think about the coronavirus, of course. The first time we heard about it was around about November, right? So. It happened elsewhere, Wuhan district, China. You were hearing news about it and so on and so forth, right? And then for a brief while, it seemed to have been under control. Then suddenly it went to Italy. And then there was this whole news of coronavirus sort of spreading around Italy and so on. And I distinctly remember from personal experience that in March, we were in a department meeting 
where our department chair actually said that I'm, I'm very careful, but you should be ready for the university to, to shut down. And in two weeks, the university shut down. So effectively, this kind of ebb and flow, suddenly people forget about it and then it comes back again. People forget about it, comes back again, and then bang, it mattered not whence it came, but all agreed it was coming to Holland again. We can almost say, if from me coming to sitting here in Oklahoma, it mattered not whence it came, but all of us have agreed that it comes to Norman, Oklahoma in some ways, right? So there's a way in which the very contemporaneity of this particular narrative is sort of signaled by this first, this first two paragraphs that you see in, in, in Defoe's Journal of the Plague Year. Okay, so let me begin by thinking a little bit more about um, <clears throat> these four things that I isolated. As I said, the first thing is that a lot of plague narratives will begin, especially modern plague narratives, will begin by placing it within specific time markers, like September 1663. When you read Albert Camus' The Plague, it says it was there in February, so on and so. And, and there's this precise calendrical and also the notion of clock time that comes up in some ways. It's almost like a documentary retelling. It comes in slow waves, then it becomes fast. But effectively, it comes within what you would call clock time, so to speak, or calendrical time. Or what, in a different way, Benedict Anderson, this famous imagined community is called homogeneous empty time. This is the homogeneous empty time of capital. This is also the homogeneous empty time of what we call the concept of the globe, the interconnected globe. And that's something I'll talk about in greater detail when I show you that clip from World War Z. I'd like to first of all elaborate though <clears throat> on this second aspect, the plague always coming from elsewhere, right? As we noticed, for instance, in uh, Journal of the Plague Year, you notice, for instance, that this notion of the plague as an invasion by a foreign body into the body politic, right? Now think a little bit about how viruses tend to be figured here. Viruses are figured almost like foreign invaders that invade the autonomy of a, of a human body, which is thought of as a whole, or metaphorically speaking, you can move the human body into a national body, so to speak in some sense, right? Therefore, one of the classic sort of figurations that you will see in times of the plague is national borders closing down. So effectively, foreign invaders need to be stopped at the border, so to speak, in some ways. This, of course, brings to its extreme certain discourses about outsiderness, about immigration, and so on and so forth that we see even in quote unquote normal circumstances, but especially in plagues. I mean, think about the, the things that, that are put into, play, into, into place here, right? Whether in the US, whether in India, whether elsewhere for that matter, it's almost as if the national body is thought of as a singular body, right? And what needs to be stopped is the invasion of this foreign element from outside. So this is one of the key bits. There's also what you could call the politics of naming plagues, so to speak, in some ways. I was recently reading an article in the journal Nation by Sonal Shah, and she said something interesting there, that especially in Western contexts, for a long period of time, right, plagues always used to be named by their places of origins, but these places of origins always happened to be elsewhere. So you had the Spanish flu, for instance, of 1918, right? Ebola, again, because the name, for instance, came effectively from its place of origin in, 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 in the center of continental Africa, so to speak. And here's a peculiar kind of xenophobia which goes on. If you think, for instance, about the spread of, of plagues like HIV and so on, the first place it was marked on are places like Los Angeles and San Francisco. But when you say AIDS, for instance, you don't call it the Los Angeles virus, so to speak, in some ways, right? Again, the notion of naming becomes very fundamental. Therefore, in 2015, you know, WHO actually asked people to give neutral naming guidelines, so to speak, in some ways. Therefore, yeah, coronavirus or the novel sort of virus that we call, you know, of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Although, if you listen carefully, for instance, to, to public discourse, Attempts at racializing and otherizing to happen. Donald Trump, in his classic racist fashion, he came to Oklahoma recently in, in Tulsa. And that's where he said, for instance, that this is nothing but the Kung flu, right? So effectively, in some ways, racializing the virus 
calling it the Chinese virus and stuff like that. So this idea of the invader, as I said, is also very, very fundamental, so to speak. I mean, the, the, of the virus always being an exerciseance from outside, so to speak. Therefore, you can almost see, for instance, the proliferation of war metaphor, especially when it goes, for instance, into fighting viruses. Trump himself calls him, himself the wartime president. I mean, all American presidents in different ways are wartime president because they're always at war. But here in some ways, you can almost think, for instance, about Trump in some ways, presenting itself through a sort of a martial metaphor, so to speak, as if the invader has to be killed outside. So the first thing we need to think about is that when we think about playing narratives, this is a powerful way for us to think about otherness and the other as enemy, so to speak. Does it always have to be that way though, right? I think there are other ways in which viral narratives can also be sort of, and I'm going to give a brief sort of an explanation for this. Here we have to think a little bit about the ontological status of viruses, right? There are many viruses, there are uncountable viruses for that matter in the biome. It's only a very few that actually become harmful to humans. But if you look specifically at the ontology of viruses, right? They are in some ways also fundamental for the evolution of life processes itself. And this is where I would like to link it to my work on the Anthropocene. When we say the Anthropocene, one way of thinking about the Anthropocene is the imprint that the human leaves on the geological record. Therefore, Anthropos, right, effectively leaving a stratigraphic marker on what you would call the, 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 Earth's, the Earth's record. One that might actually, in some sense, go beyond our own extinction into some inhuman time scale, so to speak. But the other way of thinking about it is to say, for instance, that what the Anthropocene really challenges us to do is to think about deep time, is to think about the time of the human as a mere blip in what we would call the life, the history of the life of the planet itself. And here, viruses begin to play a very interesting role, because if you look specifically at what viruses are, they are neither life nor non-life. Right. They are effectively, the, the comparison that Louis Villarreal, who is the very famous uh, microbiologist, he makes is that viruses are potentialities like seeds. Seeds are both life and not life. Some seeds can germinate, some seeds can die, but effectively they are both life and non-life. And effectively, in some ways, viruses are similar to that as well, so to speak, in some ways, right? So there's a way in which you can think about viruses, not necessarily only as invaders, but as symbionts, so to speak, that in many ways brings up certain notions, so to speak, of what you would call um, <clears throat> the evolution of life processes itself, right? So that's the first thing. That's the complicating factor, I would say. I mean, one of the ways in which we need to go away, and I think Defoe's narrative already highlights that, is to think about viruses almost as invasions of let's say an autonomous self-sufficient body from outside right whether it's as i said whether we think of our human body as self-sufficient and autonomous which it is not it is actually part it is entangled with an ecosystem so to speak in some ways it's open to many ecosystems but especially in modernity especially in the post cartesian age when he says i think therefore i am we are conditioned in some ways to thinking about our bodies as autonomous self-sufficient units. And therefore, the outsider, the foreigner, comes from outside. And in many ways, it's, it invades the, the, the autonomy of your bodily space. And as I said, metaphorically speaking, national bodies are often equated with what you call individual bodies as well. And I think there's a way in which we can start changing that script once we recognize that pattern. So that's a, that, the that's a first pattern that I would like to sort of talk about in detail. This notion of the plague always coming from elsewhere. It always comes from, the imaginary is that it always comes from elsewhere, so to speak, right? Very often an undefined elsewhere as well, sometimes defined for that matter. Okay, <clears throat> let me give you an instantiation of, or a continuity, so to speak, of this notion of, um, <clears throat> of the plague as, as a foreigner from a brief section from Albert Camus' plague. Can I share the screen, please? Yes, sir. You can say it. Because it says that the screen sharing is disabled. I mean, I just want to point out one small thing from... Wait, sir. Okay. So let me go down. Um, okay, again, it's been disabled. Sorry. Please share it, sir. <clears throat> 
it's been disabled. The screen sharing has been disabled. Yes, no. When I try to share it, when I try to share it, it says it's disabled. Anyway, let me just briefly read out this section, okay? Um, <clears throat> Let's share it, you can share now. You can share now. Can you? Sorry. Okay. Yes, okay. Okay. This is from the second chapter of Albert Camus' play. Just to talk about some resonances of this stuff. Sorry? Okay. Uh, this is from the second chapter of Albert Camus' play. This is from the Stuart Townsend uh, translation. And this is what the narrator says. Things went so far that the Ramsdok Information Bureau inquiries on all subjects promptly and accurately answered, which ran a free information talk on the radio by way of publicity, began its talk by announcing that no less than 6,231 rats had been collected and burned in a single day, April 25th. Giving as it did an ampler and more precise view of the scene daily enacted before our eyes, this amazing figure administered a jolt to the public nerves. Hitherto, people had merely grumbled at a stupid, rather obnoxious visitation. They now realized that this strange phenomenon, whose scope they couldn't, could, be, could not be measured and whose origins escaped detection, had something vaguely menacing about it. Only the old Spaniard, whom Dr. Ryu was treating for asthma, went on rubbing his hands and chuckling. They're coming out. They're coming out with senile glee. On April 28, when the Randstock Bureau announced that 8,000 rats had been collected, collected, a wave of something like panic swept the town. There was a demand for drastic measures. The authorities were accused of slackness, and the people who had houses on the coast spoke of moving there. Now notice the resonances of what Camus is writing here with what we discussed already with our briefly alluded to in, in, the, in the Devo passage. He says, first of all, things went so far that the Randstock Information Bureau, which ran a free information talk on the radio. Here in Journal of the Plague Year, you're talking about newspapers. If you talk about progressive archeology span of the media, here we have the radio, right? The radio as this sort of new instrument that spreads news, so to speak. I mean, if you think about it, Think about the famous example of Orson Welles and his radio broadcast in 1930s, when he said that the Martians are coming, leading, if you think about it, to a state of panic throughout the nation, so in, in a way, right? So there's a way in which, for instance, newspapers spreading news instantaneously, leading to a certain amount of space-time compression. Here in the plague, written in the middle part of the 20th century, you have the reference to the radio, which by way of publicity began its talk by announcing no less than 6,231 rats had been collected and burned in a single day, April 25th. Again, notice the precise marker of calendrical time. It's on April 25th, just like in D4, it was 1664, right? Then he said, giving as it did an ampler and more precise view of the scene daily enacted before this eye, this amazing figure administered a jolt to the public nerves, right? Now, the radio said 6,231 rats had died. You know that the plague is going on. It seemed like time almost ebbed. Create this, the revelation of this information gives a jolt to the public nerves, so to speak again, right? Notice, for instance, how this ebbing and flowing of news and information about the plague moves on here as well. Hitherto, people had merely grumbled at a stupid, rather obnoxious visitation. They now realized that this strange phenomenon, whose scope could not be measured and whose origins escaped detection, had something vaguely menacing about it, right? So now people, I mean, again, we come back to coronavirus. When in November, when it was happening elsewhere in Wuhan district, it seemed very distant for us. We thought it would be controlled and so on. I didn't think about it too much, so to speak, in some ways till, for instance, that department meeting in March, right, where it seemed like it had come very close to us. And within two weeks, everything shut down, so to speak. Again, that ebbing and flowing of time, which I think is very fundamental here. Notice also that in some ways, this is the town of Oran, right? The, a French dominated, a French occupied city, for instance, in Algeria. This is where the, the novel is set. But notice how foreignness comes in, right? Not just the foreignness of the plague, but the foreignness of the foreigner. He says here, only the old Spaniard, 
whom Dr. Ryu was treating for asthma, went on rubbing his hands and chuckling. They are coming out. They are coming out. It's almost like this portent of doom. But this portent of doom is not coming from quote unquote locals, which of course come in a very ethnocentric way, makes it almost like French people occupying Algerian territory, but it comes from the Spaniard. He says, like almost like this sort of, you know, the, that prophet, that crazy prophet you'll see, for instance, in plague narratives, he's saying, they are coming out, they're coming out. He rubs his hands with senile glee. So there's this notion of foreignness coming out here as well. But the interesting thing here is towards the end, he says, on April 28th, when the Ramsdorf Bureau announced that 8,000 rats had been collected, a wave of something like panic swept through the town, right? Again, notice panic, panicos, people in movement. This is, of course, what, you know, in, in some sense, the fundamental affect or the emotional state that we can sort of associate with what we call plague narratives itself. That in some ways, information comes to you with a tremendous degree of space-time compression, right? And of course, what it does is that it creates a tremendous degree of public panic. There was a demand for drastic measures. The authorities were accused of slackness. Again, notice the resonances with our own discourses, whether in India, the US, elsewhere. And people who had houses on the coast spoke of moving there early in the year, though it was. People are trying to escape and so on. Whereas, like Dr. Moral said, that if you think about it, plague narratives are also about the haves and the have-nots. It's generally the haves who flee, where the have-nots in some ways, the poorer people, even in Defoe's narratives, face the brunt of the plague in some ways, because in some ways their mobility tends to get sort of restricted as well. So there's this notion of inequality, which is of course implicitly sort of mentioned here, although this comes out in greater detail in the rest of the narrative, both in Defoe and in Kambu as well. But I'd like to go back. So as I said, <clears throat> the second aspect, the third aspect that I wanted to point out, of course, was this question of what we call an archaeology of media narratives. Plague narratives are media narratives. And in fact, if you put them in a longer sort of way, right, you clearly see in some ways the notion of space-time being compressed, or what we call space-time compression, moving through a progressive archaeology of the media. You have uh, Defoe's novel talking about newspapers. You definitely have Camus talking about the plague. If you watch George Romero, right, the great zombie filmmaker from the United States, right, his movies have give a prominent role, for instance, to the television, right? So if you watch Night of the Living Dead, which is another great plague narrative, so to speak, in some ways, the television seems to occupy the center stage, so to speak, in some ways. When you're watching a great zombie movie like 28 Days Later, is the surveillance camera with the two So effectively, again, each one, right, in some way, gives you a certain way of approaching a certain progressive narrative of media forms and how each media form, so to speak, in some ways creates a space-time compression. In other words, it shrinks space, distant spaces seem to come together, things are happening simultaneously. And for that matter, the notion of similitude and simultaneity. So that's the thing I would sort of point out as the second aspect of this plague narrative, right? But I'd like to go back again to the, to the uh, we talked about, uh, <clears throat> we talked about the plague as the invader that comes from elsewhere and how we can complicate that. We talked about the notion of the archaeology of media narratives. I'd like to go back again to the default narration, right? In the beginning of the second paragraph, he said, we had no such things as printed newspapers in those days to spread rumors and reports of things and to improve them by the invention of men as I have lived to see practice since. The key word here, of course, is rumor, right? And I'd like us to take rumor as a speech act seriously, right? What is rumor as a speech act? When we say, for instance, rumor, right? It is speech without signature. It is speech that comes from an undefined elsewhere. And I'm using this specifically in the Derridian sense of what we call signature event and context. Let's say when I sign a paper, when for instance, I sign a contract, why do I sign that piece of paper? Because my signature is seen to be almost like an extension of my body. Right? So effectively, it's coming from an origin. This origin is my body. You can trace it back on that basis. 
you can make a legal claim, so to speak. And that's the effective, effective idea of authorship, that in some ways, through writing, through speech, like let's say I'm speaking now, and if this, for instance, is recorded, I would say I have quote unquote copyright over it. So in some ways you could say, I am the origin of this speech, so to speak, in some way, right? So there's a way in which signature is attached for that matter to a concrete sort of corporeal principle, the body here in some way. Think about rumor though, right? Where does rumor begin? It's effectively very difficult just to say who starts a rumor. Gyanendra Pandey and Veena Das who have worked on communal rights in India have talked about this notion of rumor. I've often talk, talked about rumor almost spreading like the plague in some ways or rumor beginning from an undefined elsewhere. So one way we can talk about rumor is that it is signature less speech. It is speech without signature. It comes from an undefined elsewhere. He says, we had no such things as printed newspapers in those days to spread rumors and reports of things and to improve them by the invention of men. So we do not have, of course, in before, he's talking about the before and the after, right? At that time, we did not have newspapers to spread rumors and then rumors would spread fast. They would spread virally, so to speak, in some ways. And that's what creates panic. It creates this wildfire-like sort of situation through which information spreads very rapidly, almost like a bushfire, so to speak, in some way. Cut to the present day, right? Where do we see resonances of this? Think, for instance, about why, in some sense, videos go viral. And I'm interested here in the word viral, right? What effectively does it mean? Viral videos, things that we all share on WhatsApp, things that we all share for that matter on, on Facebook or on social media profiles and so on, right? Often begin from an undefined elsewhere. When I share a funny video of dogs jumping around, I don't know who the hell the director of that video is, but then I just click that button and then it spreads pretty much like wildfire. So effectively, the spread of that is in some ways like wildfire as well. Think also about contemporary instantiations of what you would call, you know, notions of rumors, which is fake news, right? Fake news, you don't know who really starts that fake news, but effectively, again, it begins to spread virally. People share it and so on and so forth. Let me give you an example. Around April, um, a lot of my relatives and friends on WhatsApp started sort of forwarding things to me where they said that, for instance, Israel had found a cure for that matter to the, the coronavirus. Now, if you think about it, it was in its first state of being patented, but the news already spread that Israel had found the cure. More right-wing types of my relatives and so on. I mean, obviously, one way was to, was to point out certain things to me as well, but uh, they were pointing out over there, thank you, Israel, for being the savior of humanity and so on and so forth, right? Now, if you notice carefully, we are already in July and the news of basically a cure for the coronavirus, right, is effectively that rumor, but people were spreading it and this spreading went viral, right? So effectively, one way you can think about the homology of what we call plague narratives, which are about viruses, is also to think about contemporary media nar narratives where rumors spread virally. So the, the very form of fake news, the very form of what you call rumors for that matter, some, in some ways, can definitely be thought of within this paradigm as well. And someone like our friend Defoe is already pointing that out, so to speak, in some ways, right? So there's this way in which the Defoe's, it, and Defoe's narrative clearly brings out three of these aspects very clearly. I'd like to cut to the current day and sort of end my talk a little bit by talking about this notion of calendrical time that we talked about. I'd like to show you the beginning of this movie called, the opening credits of this movie called World War Z, or World War Z as we would call it in India, right? Which stars Bad Brad Pitt, a big Hollywood, big budget movie, pretty bad movie. Um, if possible, don't watch it. But, if, but I think the interesting thing here is more the opening credits, which I think there's an interesting thing in terms of placing this, what, what we call homogeneous empty time, this time of simultaneity, the simultaneity of space and the simultaneity of time, but also talks in some ways about the ebb and flow and the virus coming from elsewhere. So I'd like to basically play this clip in its entirety and then break down certain portions for you. And then we can open up the discussion for conversations later on. 
Okay, so let me begin by sharing the screen again. And here's what I want to share. Can you see the video now? No, sir. Can all of you see the video? No, sir. Can you yeah. see the video? We have to share it, sir. Okay, can I play it? No, sir. You can't see the video? Still, no, sir. You have to share it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let me just begin from the beginning again, right? I would like you to watch the whole thing, uh, and then I'll talk and I'll stop certain moments at certain moments and then discuss the sections again. This is again a zombie film, by the way. Look both at what is coming on the screen and also the music, please. emissions have dramatically increased in the last... Are decade. there any real threats that you know of? Not at all. Environmentalists are trying to determine the cause of death. At an alert level, six WHO guidelines for governments will be... Your socks are so cute! Police say they've seen similar cases recently of people behaving strangely. The UN Health Agency is not likely to recommend official travel restrictions. It will be unsettling. Sunday They're not Wednesday. physicists. They're not engineers. They think it's just going to go away. They live in a fantasy parallel universe. And people demand demons for men of the world. All the talk about a doomsday is a big hoax. Some big crowd and continue to evolve. The best estimate is a thousand We don't know if this is right. Rhythms of change. So far, there's no manifestation. Okay, <clears throat> let me talk about this sequence and let me break down this sequence in light of what we have said earlier. Think for instance about how it begins. Both the sound and the images. The first shot, and I'm pausing it here, the first shot is that of the waves coming in. And of course, the movement of the clouds. It begins with a scene of nature. It's at this point that you hear the music in the background in slow waves. What we are pitched into from the time of nature, of course, the, the rhythm of nature, the wave, waves coming up, the clouds moving and so on, is what we'll call the time of everyday life. And here, it's interesting that the world seems to be waking up to so This is New York, people this stepping out of the, the, the well, river. And Chatton, then of course you have an image from Thanks India, right? right? We have Shanghai, right? Well, in Japan, right planes bring out, right? And so on. Now there's something which is going on interestingly here, right? Already with Defoe, when we talk about what we call the newspaper, right? The newspaper in Benedict Anderson's famous thesis is the one that brings about a notion of simultaneity. So let's say someone reading the, the same newspaper in Guwahati is reading the same newspaper in Delhi, right? We are not exactly in the same time or space, but what he says is that in the ritual of reading it, you imagine a national or an imagined community into being. He also talks about the novel as another sort of print capitalist form that brings about the imaginary of the nation. But you see that, for instance, in Defoe as well, right? So you have no newspapers, people reading it in London, people reading it in Glasgow, people reading it in Swansea and so on, reading the same thing at the same time. And this is how an imagination of the unit called a nation comes into being. Here, it seems in some ways that as we are talking about the progressive evolution of the media, this notion of simultaneity 
is coming up almost at a global level, right? So effectively, time starts in slow waves with the waves and so on and so forth, right? And then you have different places in some ways waking up. So you have New York, the sun setting up and setting out in New York already. It's daytime in India. So it seems like you're occupying the same global time, so to speak, in some sense. Within this sort of spatial imaginary called the globe, you're almost occupying what you would call the same time. And it's people waking up and so on. It's everyday life. It's what we call normal life, right? Or normal, ordinary life with its slow rhythms, people coming out of the train, uh, the, the, the people plying the trade, probably in Bombay, people going to their offices in Shanghai and places like that. In this clip though, it, it's interesting that again, something ominous begins to come, come in, not so much with humans, but with forms of animal alterity or forms of animals sort of what you call uh, otherness. At first, there are the birds flying, which of course, you know, the birds waking up in the morning and so on. Here are the people coming this out. This is JTL the Morning News. Good morning. This is Welcome Holly Channing. I'm Kathy. Thanks this for joining us. We have a great show in the morning. Well, it's a great and here's the planes going out of the body, just like the ships coming to the body of the ship. Again, everyday time. But notice, here's the first image of animal alterity. It's the swarming, seething mass of insects, right? So in some ways, what you could see as this insectile swarm, as this form of animal otherness that clearly comes up. There's something which is dangerous here. We can talk a lot about the alterity of insects. You can go to Kafka, all these other people, right? But there's this notion of insect swarms, both as vectors of disease and as something effectively different from what you would call the notion of humanity. It moves on. Right? The music is still slow. The images are still going slowly. Again, you see India, for instance. You see a news report. People working through the Twin Bridge. Here's the first intimation of danger, right? It begins with the scene of the waves coming in. Then you have dolphins being beached by something mysterious. So something is changing, definitely. And if you notice carefully in the background, the music is also changing in tempo, right? It's definitely becoming faster, right? So effectively, as the individual length of the shots begin to shorten, the music begins to increase in speed as well, right? So now you have the, the dolphins Another here. Group of dolphins you still see the nature. CO2 emissions have dramatically here. increased in the last... Here's a key, there... key sort of image again. Of real another form of animal Are there any real I just want to sort of focus on this wolf a little bit. Any real threats that you know? Not at all. Sorry. Are there any real threats? Have you notice the second form of animal alterity that comes up, besides the notion, for instance, of insects, is the image of the wolf. In the political theology of the West, the wolf has had a very specific role. You can go back to Thomas Hobbes. In his book, Deceive, he says, how do you define the human? He says, homo homini lupus, homo homini deus. Man is God to man, man is a wolf to man. So the wolf specific, specifically figures, if you think about it, as a representation of a certain form of animal being to which in some sense you revert back to in the state of nature without the guiding hand of the sovereign. Homo homini lupus, homo homini deus, right? So man is God to man, Man is wolf to man. This is not his Leviathan. This is an earlier text, DC, but this is how he begins by metaphysically defining the human, so to speak. The notion of the lupine character of the human being, the wolf-like character of the human being. Okay, let's move on. Again, we are seeing images of nature. Not at all. People connected well, friends. Are trying to determine the course of death at the alert level. The home and so on. Every night we are The music is in the music. Your socks are so cute. Police say they've seen similar cases in India again. People behaving strangely. Borders. The UN health agency. Controlled borders being policed, right? And then it's not likely to recommend official travel restrictions. Although Corona like this, they're wearing their masks. People enjoying, for instance, not physicists. They're not engineers. They think it's just going to go away. They live in a fantasy parallel universe. Everyday life. Now notice the length of the shot. All the talk about a doomsday is a big hoax. It's a big crowd. Continue to all. 
particular sequence is something which I think goes back to the paradigm of plague narratives that we've talked about. On the one hand, the slow ebbing of everyday life, <clears throat> the gradual positioning into crisis, the policing of borders, panic being spread through the media. If you listen carefully to the background, first it's radio broadcast, then it's television, then news spreading, for instance, to cell phones, internet, media, things going viral, right? And then, of course, different representations of animality. Of you have on the one hand animals as vectors of disease. You have on the other hand the wolf as the altar of the human, right? Homo homini lupus, so to speak, in some ways. And then, as the crisis, one does not know where it emerged from, but now it was here. It comes here, and as a moment it comes here, the montage speeds up. The music also increases in tempo and the plague is finally here, so to speak, in some sense, right? So effectively, you come to that moment of crisis, panikos, and effectively, if you think about the montage as well, it's trying in some ways to capture the sense of panikos in, in many ways. So therefore, this is the conclusion to this talk. I'd like, I, I can talk about more dimensions in the Q&A session, but let's think a little bit about Defoe's kind of contemporaneity. First of all, he thinks about placing it in calendrical clock time that simultaneously in the nation, almost everyone is experiencing or imagining they're they are experiencing the same thing with the standardization of time or what we can call the universalization of the time standard, like roughly around the 19th century and the Cartesian mapping of space. We also have the globe in a certain way coming up as a unit, right? So effectively, when you come, once you come to World War Z, you see the global spread of the virus. Although, as I said, already in other forms, the globe existed earlier, the ships coming into the national body and so on. It of course existed from antiquity, but what is specific about the modernity of this is this notion of tremendous space-time compression, which is coming through a progressive archeology span of the media, right? As I said, if you place Defoe at the head, newspapers, we can sort of trace it down one by one from newspapers, radio, television, internet, and so on and so forth, things slowly spreading in, in some ways very fast, almost like a bushfire, right? Effectively creating panic, putting people in movement and so on. But also the other dimension of what we call media, which is how news begins to become viral. And that's why the notion, the metaphor of virality is so important here, that it's like the virus, just like it spreads through contact, right? Don't go out with a mask in coronavirus because you can capture it. And once one person captures it, it spreads elsewhere, right? You don't know what the source or who the source of that infection is, but in some sense, it has arrived here, right? And the same thing goes with the media. You don't know where fake news operates from. You don't know where digital rumors operate from or emerge from. They are signature less speech, but then there's a viral spread. And effectively, a lot of people see it at the same time, creating the situation of panic and so on, right? So there's this pattern, as I said, which comes up with these, mod with these early modern narratives, which I think are useful to read in light of the current moment. There are others about closure, there are others about capitalist consumption, for instance, and we can talk about in Defoe's narratives as well. But I'd like to briefly end my talk here and maybe open this up for questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. The session was indeed very insightful and thought-provoking. Thank you so much, Dr. Bushyo, for sharing with us your thoughts and perspectives on this very relevant topic. Now we are ready to take questions. Interaction session begins here. Bornali, can we take the first question? Yes, ma'am. Yes, can we take the first question? Uh, can... There is a question from Padmanabha Mohanty. The okay. question is that, is there any cases of plague after 1966 or 67? I mean, is there any report on 19th or 20th century? Sorry, is there any report of? So is there any, ca is there any report on 19th and 20th century? 
on a nineteenth and a twentieth century. Yes, yes. I mean, uh, does Doctor so Kokita want to plague after ninety-six? Or, or, okay, I mean, in the nineteenth, in the twentieth century, clearly, I mean, this is in some ways what you can say the age of pandemics itself, right? I mean, you can think a little bit about AIDS, right? And the massive scare that it had in the 1980s and then going down to the 1980s. I mean, the, the beginning of this century is, this, this is the century of pandemics in some ways. It began with the avian flu. We talked about swine flu. Now we are in Corona. Who knows as the permafrost sort of goes, you know, begins to melt in the Arctic, we might have John Carpenter's thing coming out next for that matter. I mean, that's, another wonderful movie to think about in terms of the, the current conjuncture itself. Um, what is, of course, to answer this question though, um, what might be interesting to think about, especially from the 19th century to the 21st, is the gradual incursion of, let's say, human beings on a greater scale into what we call spots of biodiversity. Plagues always used to happen. I mean, plagues used to happen for different reasons. But the peculiar feature of what we call contemporary plagues obviously comes from the fact that in some ways we have intruded, so to speak, right? We have intruded into or we have changed. And that's what the Anthropocene is about, that we have left the human imprint on larger notions of bio biodiverse sort of circulation and stuff like that, right? Even about, let's say, the coronavirus. I mean, the idea, if you think about it, has been, it's a zoonotic sort of uh, disease. It transfers from animals to, to human beings. You could say that, oh yeah, this is something that happened even earlier with rats being the vectors of plague and so on. But I think the peculiar modernity or contemporaneity of what we call plagues per se would be this notion, for instance, in how we live in actually very synthetic environments now, right? And these synthetic environments often create relatively novel forms of viral outbreaks. And here we have to think about viruses, not as necessarily enemies or you know, invaders at all time. They can actually exist as symbionts as well. What is infectious for us may actually be symbiotic for an animal, right? Vice versa, so to speak, in some ways. But it's peculiar that certain types of viruses, certain types of novel viruses have begun to emerge, if you think about it, as what we call the notion of the planet begins to change because of human activity. This, of course, does not necessarily put humans as the villains of the peace, because I would also go against this sort of notion where we think about, oh, we humans have destroyed the planet. To a large extent, we have. But as I said, this can also become an eco-fascist discourse. But it's important here to think, for instance, about our entanglement with what we consider these larger biomic sort of questions itself. And that's where vectors of plagues and pandemics need to be located, especially in the contemporary conjuncture. Thank you. Okay, Thank the you. next question is, could you please explain how pandemic novels treat space in its narration? Mm -hmm. Does uh, Dr. Kolita want to answer this? Or, uh, uh, I mean, I can go after that, but if she no, wants no, to No, no, uh, no, I think you can take it. Uh, I found a question directed at me, so I... I see. I'm not sure uh, if the if the chat box has shown it up, but I could see a question for myself. Yes, so ma'am. There are some questions directed to you, but I couldn't. Yeah. <laughs> so no, I'll, 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 I'll see me, the question. So I'll, I'll, I'll answer, answer, but I think yeah. uh, Amit should answer this one. How is space represented, right? Um, I did talk, for instance, about the simultaneity of space. Whether we think about it through larger units, we can move from, let's say, the the unit of the city. Right? We can move to the unit of the nation, we can move to the unit of the globe. So there's this notion of simultaneity in World War Z, when you saw that clip, for instance, it's simultaneously happening inside, right? But there's another dimension through which you can think about speciality, which is to think, for instance, about how, and here, plague narratives, or let's, let's say the classic plague narratives are also city narratives in some ways, right? Just like General the Plague Year is a narrative about London, you have the plague as a, as a narrative about Oran, right? You have almost the shuttering down of the city block by block, right? In, in general, the plague year, this happens effectively by the closing down of parishes, right? So it's parish by parish. And the, in that section that I, that, that I read out, um, the first thing comes from a particular parish that per parish tends to be quarantined, right? And then slowly you can see almost like the disease working its way through the city itself. And then block by block, parish by parish, 
and so on, things begin to sort of close down. Think about Guwahati now, right? My mother can't get out of the house effectively because of the lockdown. You, you, you heard about this, for instance, outside. And then once it comes in, block by block, block by block, the things close down as well. So it, effectively, you can think about pandemic narratives also as peculiarly sort of urban narratives of urban speciality, right? That it begins slowly, but then things begin to close down almost block by block. Things begin to close down almost perish by perish, so to speak, in some sense, right? So there's this interesting way in which a certain mapping of the city also happens to these plague narratives itself. So that's the, if we may put it this way, that while the question of the simultaneity of space or the shrinkage of space that I talked about brings the plague narratives into more global dimensions, what you can also think about is the more inward looking dimension located in a particular place, but how it impacts that particular place itself. And that's how, again, the question of temporality comes up. It happens slowly, but then effectively at after a certain point, you have the city sort of closing down. And then you have a witness like what you see, for instance, General of the Plague here as he's moving around, like Dr. Kalida said, right? You can clearly see the piles of dead bodies coming out on the side. And he's a witness to that, for that, the, the bodies being thrown into the pits and stuff like that, right? If Samuel Peep's diary talks about that as well, but a lot of these early modern narratives definitely talk about that as well. But think about the lockdown as a specific aspect of that in some sense. You can go to the next question. Or... Ma'am, unmute yourself. The argument, unmute yourself. Ma'am, unmute yourself. Have you found the question for Aki, ma'am? There's a question for Aki, ma'am. Yes, I can see it. Yes, okay, ma'am, please. Uh, let's let's not waste time because I can see yeah. it right there. Yes. Okay. It says, how does an impossibly incurable pestilence in modern times uh, help revive generations of cultures of pandemic literature? And how does one then analyze the timeline to make sense of the way it needs to be? Okay, so I can, I can, I can understand where this is coming from. Is that because, uh, because uh, you know, the, the panel, the discussion that we just had is already telling us that uh, you know in a in in a deliberation on how we are and what we are in the pandemic in a plague actually makes us recall several other plague narratives and several other uh, other pandemic discourses so i think one of the things that it is really telling us this this whole uh, this whole idea of why, for example, we are kind of recalling, why, why is this whole flow of uh, narratives coming back in time, from time, is that um, quite remarkably, the pandemic actually establishes a continuum from history right into the contemporary. So I think what, uh, and then it also ties in uh, to a sense with, uh, ties in uh, with uh, what Amit was talking about was, this, there is a simultaneity, which if not in time, is a simultaneity experience, is, is, a, is a circularity. There is a circularness of how a pandemic or how a plague has happened in history. And perhaps, uh, you know, as, as, as uh, uh, we, we, we've also found out that uh, while we talk about how the pandemic, how the plague narratives are written now and why, you know, in the manner that we write them now, uh, one is constantly comparing them to older narratives. So I would imagine that pandemic literature or plague literatures, plague narratives as we call them, uh, do in some spaces do hide these little hidden, you know, these, these small bits and pieces of knowledge that's all, that also needs to be curated. For example, uh, if you look back at the plague narratives or pandemics of another century or the previous century, so how was the smallpox, for example, eradicated? 
I mean, have we, have we thought while we were uh, talking about this pandemic of COVID-19, we, you know, if you, if you go back in time and you might realize that there was a time perhaps, uh, you know, several, several decades ago that we were still fighting the smallpox. And perhaps when we read these narratives, when we read even medical histories and imaginative fictional works, I think there is an attempt to retrieve some sources of knowledge and some information. And finally, I think, uh, you know, if the question, I, I, I don't know, the question seems to also indicate that there is a culture of pandemic literature. Oh, I, will, nice. I will end up saying that uh, while these are, these are physical pathological conditions, while this is about disease and, and science, it is as much about imagination because uh, you know all the narratives that we have treated today, all the literatures that we've brought in today, uh, recurrently they keep repeatedly telling us that uh, there is so much that can be read into how a disease, how a pestilence, how a, a plague uh, can actually be handled. And this is not what medical science alone tells you. And which is why I think it is being told um, and I, I remember reading this somewhere that um, men of letters and of course women, men and women of letters have uh, brought out much more fantastic pandemic literatures than perhaps uh, medical science, people from medical science have. So while you have, the imagine, while you have the information, you may not have the imagination of dealing with uh, the species, the human species. And on the other hand, as Omid says, you know, the, the, the lines that distinguish the human species from humanity. So I think these are border lines and boundaries that we keep blurring, that keep blurring into each other. Yeah. I Thank hope you have a question. Next question is, some of the most inspiring stories in literature are about the battle against unknown. Who would you say is the hero in them? Can you compare them to mythical narrative and the archetypal hero? Sorry, we, uh, uh, so who is it to? Uh, actually, it's not written. What is the question? I didn't get it. Okay, some I mean, of the, right, most... the question was about the heroic narratives, right? I okay. mean, whether we think of this in terms of mythical narratives right. and, yeah. and yes. uh, you know, narratives of hope and so on and so forth. Right, right. Yeah. My response to that would be, I'll just give a brief response to this and then turn it over to you. Um, my response to that would be, while on the one hand, yes, there are certain mythical precedents that you can talk about with disease as the invader, the foreigner, and so on and so forth. I'm a little skeptical, though, of heroic narratives as well, right? Partially, one of the, the I mean, this goes back to what uh, Dr. Moral was saying in the previous one, that when we think, for instance, about the eradication of smallpox and so on, one of the specific features of modernity, right, the, the classic heroic narrative of modernity is that of the, the conquest of disease, right? So effectively, in some ways, you can think, I mean, colonial narratives are all about that. Like Calcutta Chromosome actually builds, gives this alternative thing about, for instance, how Ronald Ross becomes this lone hero fighting malaria, whereas actually he had the whole background of native knowledge helping him and so on. But this is such an endemic narrative of modernity that in some sense, our conquest of nature, right? One of the biggest narrative paradigms is the conquest of disease itself. That in some ways we can think, for instance, about uh, the lengthening of the lifespan and so on. And that's a heroic narrative that you can almost call it an epic. And that's why in some ways, when you read these narratives of Pasteur and, and, and Ronald Ross and so on, it's often in that epic heroic mode. Right? I'm skeptical of that, though, in some sense. And what if there are diseases that you cannot quite, quote unquote, conquer, so to speak, in some sense? What if it shows you your vulnerability? And I think this is the issue that I want us to sort of think about, especially when we are thinking about Corona as well, and especially when we are thinking, for instance, about our contemporary period, that maybe this narrative that everything will just go away and effectively we'll find a cure and something new will come up, right? Maybe that's one way of looking at it, but maybe one way of looking at it is to think about our global vulnerability itself, our vulnerability as a species. And I think this is where maybe a different way of narration can probably be framed, but that's my response to it. Well, I'd be interested to hear what you think. Um, well, I, I, I of course agree with you in the sense that, uh, you know, combating disease, combating illness, um, 
these are huge conquests of history. I mean, you're not conquering lands and it's not advancement of, simply advancement of knowledge, but you're actually defeating uh, those, uh, you know, diseases that have afflicted humanity for such a long time. And uh, I think there's this very good example from uh, the presentation that uh, I was attempting to make. I, I don't know if people saw it, but uh, in the Milroy lectures, for example, and we're going back to the early century, early 20th century, in the Milroy lectures, uh, which were actually given to the Royal College of uh, Physicians in London, uh, this gentleman, doctor, goes back to London with the knowledge that he has from a Kala Azar, uh, you know, uh, study of Kala Azar in the Brahmaputra Valley. And this is his most heroic moment because, you know, he comes back with testimony, he comes with evidence that that malarial parasite causing black fever has actually been, uh, you know, decimated, at least mm -hmm. for some time. And for a long, you know, for long spells, it was decimated. So I do think that in that sense, it is heroic. But mm -hmm. on the yes, but on the other hand, as uh, Amit says, I also agree that there are there are too many other issues that are involved with mm -hmm. diseases and with the way we write and we think of them and the way we narrate them and we go back into the histories of these uh, diseases that would certainly require much more subtlety. Would require a a a, a, a much finer way of looking at disease and beyond disease. I think it is not just disease. We don't just stop at the horizons of disease, but I think you push beyond disease into, you know, elsewhere, into there where we, where, what, what we don't know. So I think, yes, it's difficult to simply say that these are narratives which are heroic, totally heroic. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. There's uh, another question. The reference of bubonic plague has been there in some literary works, but there are no works which deals with this. What is the reason for it? Not very specific. I think uh, Dr. Kulita can talk about this more in terms of the bubonic plague because I think she she got she talked more about this. So yes, maybe sir. I can just follow it up. Yeah. What, what, what was this? Uh, what is this? Yes, that's not clear, ma'am. The question is like the reference of bubonic plague has been there in some literary works, mm -hmm. but there are no works which deals with this. That this is not very clear in the question. Yeah, yeah I think. We've shown a whole lot of uh, reference to history, to narratives, to historians, to journals which have gone into the bubonic plague, you know, Pep's diary. We've taken narratives from Shakespeare. We've looked at mm -hmm. how rhetoric and imagery prefigure, I mean, figure in all of those narratives. Uh, but uh, I don't know what is this. I suppose, are you talking about Amit, you have any idea what he's talking about? Well, I mean, bubonic plague, I mean, in many ways, you can say the journal of the plague here is definitely a memorialization of what you call the yes. bubonic plague itself. So in many ways, you already see that in, in many of these narrations, so to speak. Although the, the plague is left undefined in the plague, right, by Camus, I mean, with the rats dying and so on, you would assume that the image that he's taking is that of the bubonic plague as well. I mean, it comes in interesting ways, the bubonic plague, and especially this imagery of rats, right? I mean, I was just thinking, for instance, about even, um, you know, uh, Dracula coming, for instance, to London. When he comes to London, the ship, you know, it's the rats, which are also good out there. If you watch the Werner Herzog movie with, with, um, with uh, 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 Klaus Kinski, as he's coming down from the ship, you see this whole image of rats. So, I mean, this medieval, early modern image of rats as the vectors of disease, right? So, effectively, that's how, in some sense, in cultural memory, the bubonic plague has already been institutionalized, so to speak, right. in some sense. Right? It comes even in narratives which are not purely the plague narratives like Dracula, but again, London being invaded by this kind of barbarian from Eastern Europe coming to vampirize and so on, but he comes with this plague of rats, right? So there's this image that keeps on coming back constantly, so to speak, in some way. So. Thank you. There's another question directed to Dr. Uh, Boisha. Sir, I have another question. How can we connect the concept of post-humanism to pandemic literature? That's a huge question. Yeah. And uh, one of the parts of what I've been talking about in my talk, I mean, especially, I mean, is from a certain sort of post-human standpoint as well. And I think 
when you talk about post-humanism, one way of thinking about it, the more kind of like teleological way of thinking about it is what comes after the human, right? So effectively, in many ways, a lot of science fiction, a lot of pandemic narratives have already sort of thought about this after of the human, post-human, if you may think of the post with a dash in some sense, right? But there's a different way in which we can bring back post-humanity or post-human attributes into thinking, for instance, about our entanglements with both natural and technological aspects of our being, so to speak. Because what I think post-humanism does is that it goes against that Cartesian paradigm that the human can sort of separate oneself, so to speak, in some sense, from what is outside. There is no, clearly, if you think about it, it's a critique of what you call the subject-object division. It's more, if you think about it, this notion of entanglement. I think Donna Haraway has this wonderful, yeah. wonderful image of how she thinks about the body as an ecosystem. Because think about our bodies, right? It's simultaneously home to many critters, many germs, and so on. So effectively, in some ways, this whole idea of the autonomy of the body is already, in some sense, critiqued. If you think about your own body and the type of organisms that are living in your mouth, in your skin, in your eyes, in the crevices behind your ears, in your hair, and so on. So that effectively, you can think about your body as an entangled ecosystem already, with both its affirmative and negative direction, so to speak, in some ways. So I think if we think about pandemic narratives in that heroic mode that we talked about, right? The heroic mode in which, let's say, medicine and the modernist idea of medicine conquers nature, we risk in some ways reinstating anthropocentrism with the, where the human is the center at the, at, the, at the center of things. I think the other way of looking at it is that pandemic narratives also talk about interconnections and entanglements and shared vulnerabilities. And I think this is where the post-human aspect of it might be interesting to think about both ethically and politically. And this is where I think a lot of people sometimes misunderstand Anthropocene discourse as well as simply like global warming and what we human species have done to the planet. But I think the challenge is to really think about our entanglement, our history of life as part of a longer history of life and non-life and probably even death in the planet. And I think this is the more radical, non-anthropocentric, post-humanist aspect of what we can have. Thank you. Another question. How can humanity hold itself together in the times of such pandemics? Does Dr. Kulita want to go first? I don't have a clear answer to this, but as I think about it, maybe, you know. You know, um, I'm immediately thinking of, um, I'm immediately thinking of Atwood's Oryx and Craig. And this is the end of the world, literally. We are also looking at what Omid just said, was this world where, you know, you, there are entanglements. You are actually connected to so much more than the human. But in this world that we are talking about, and uh, as an answer to this question, I think one is thinking about uh, how you are at almost the end of the world. All that you have is a, yet another human to connect to you, a human slash animal, perhaps, a human slash alien, perhaps. And then the, these connections bring about this, this, this hopefulness, this idea of what pandemic literature, you know, might actually distill from a world which is looking so dystopian, from a world which is looking so completely decimated and at the end of the, its death, that from there, I think, comes. And, you know, I'm immediately thinking before Amit can speak, I'm immediately thinking of another thing, you know, these images and these these media images that have been captured over this long period of the pandemic that we've been, uh, you know, uh, cloistered in. What we can see over and above these images of bleakness, of death, of disease, of hopelessness, I'm also seeing, I'm also being able to catch images of human bondedness, of human bondings and connectedness, of, you know, of help, of stretching out hands, joining hands. So I would like to see, you know, I, I, would, I would like to see, you know, a, a certain kind of wholeness instead, instead of a certain kind of rupture here. And, and perhaps, you know, uh, Amit can probably look at uh, a, a scene beyond that, because he's, he's obviously also looking at the post-human. <laughs> I, I can't look at the crystal ball and say anything, but I mean, the way I would say it is, um, I think that I'd, I'd, I'd chime with you. Um, I would give, like, let's say, 
three different possible answers to this question. One, of course, is through the standpoint of the media that we talked about already, right? That effectively on one way, in one way we can think about, we've talked about the viral potential of media, but on the more affirmative way is to think about the viral potential of media and making people come together. I mean, think about the Black Lives Protest Matter now yes. and the way in which it has gone viral globally, so to speak, in some sense. It becomes a new protest language in many ways. I mean, it's going pretty much everywhere, so to speak, in some ways. So there's a way in which notions of human collectivity also go viral. As I said, there's a peculiar ambiguity in these metaphors. And as both a person who's worked on animal theory as well as an Anthropocene, I'm very interested in thinking about these ambiguities. I keep seeing Felani in the background of Dr. Kulita's um, uh, uh, shelf. There's an interesting thing there that it begins, for instance, with this image of Guhi Purwa, right? That if people are de de described, for instance, as objects, but towards the end of the novel, the Guhi Purwa survived by coming together. So it becomes almost like a subject formation of a certain sort, right? So just to give an example from, from uh, the shelf that I see, the book that I see, the translation by, by Deepika Pukwan that I see in your background. So that's one part of the question. I think the other issue, and I sort of alluded to this in my talk, and let me expand on this a little bit more, right? Is the way in which forms of collectivity come in. And this is something which is there, which is first um, interestingly and controversially signaled by Dupes Chakraborty in his essay, Climate of History. He said that, for instance, the notion of humanity comes from the notion of homo, right? Or which is the Latin homo, which is this collective subject through which in some ways we can think about notions of what we call environmental justice and so on, collectivities coming on through shared interests. What he says, interestingly, is that what the Anthropocene challenges us to do is to think about this notion through the idea of a human species, not humanity per se, but through a notion of a human species, right? So effectively bringing our species life into the equation. This is what he calls a more non-ontological formulation of politics which comes to a notion of collectivity, which comes to this other collective formation, which is this notion of species itself, right? And I think this is where a form of politics to come when we talk about species survival, right? We are noticing, for instance, uh, movements happening about global warming. I mean, or even for that matter, um, visible symbols like Greta Thunberg and so on becoming so big for instance, in the global sphere, right? And when they're talking, for instance, about global politics and so on, because one of the things that I think a lot of what the current Anthropocene movement asks us to do is to reinvent the wheel of politics itself, to reinvent in some sense, the notion of human collectivity itself. And maybe one way of thinking about that would be to think about it through the notion of species life. In some sense, our entanglement with forms of species life. How does this operate? I think, one of the primary dimensions, at least in the imaginative format, and here I completely disagree with Amitabh Ghosh when he writes in the great derangement that science fiction should be in the outhouses of fiction. I think good science fiction has actually taught us in some ways of imagining this. So if I were to use a crystal ball in the way you were talking about, many of these, Oryx and Crake obviously is a great example. You can talk about Octavia Butler, but I've been reading Vandana Singh very recently and her works about the near future, especially in a climate scare scarred by global change, tries, I think, to think about this notion of human species as collectivity, which is a very different notion from the way in which we have talked about humanity coming together. Of course, these two things converge, but they are also somewhat different, so to speak, in some sense. It's, the point is to bring them together in this current moment of crisis. We, we have come to our last question, and uh, that is, uh, the question says, you have talked about the virus as a symbiont. So can there be a narrative which deals with COVID-19 as a life fighting for itself? That's a difficult thing to say, what we can say in terms of COVID-19 specifically, but I can definitely point towards narratives that talk about viruses as symbionts, right? Because remember, one of the things, I mean, again, as I said, I can't predict whether we can say something like COVID-19 will play a role in that dimension. But if you think about viruses, right, the viruses are what we call, you know, the older form of what we call the parasite. And generally, when we say parasites, they have negative connotations. They are something that sucks the energy out of your body and so on, right? Mm 
But again, notice the ambiguity. Here, for instance, Parasite, if you go by Michel Serres, who wrote this famous book called Parasite, it's like living side by side. And even if you go back, for instance, to Roman plays and so on, the, par the, par the parasite is the one who comes to your meals and entertains you. It's almost like the guest in some senses, mm -hmm. right? So in some ways, you can peculiarly think about the ambiguity of the term parasite itself because it lives with, with both its attendant dangers as well as its possibilities for hospitality. And I'll give you just one instance of a text that I've worked on, which gives a very different narrative of the virus. It's a wonderful illness narrative. It's by Elizabeth Tova Bailey. It's called The Sound of a Wild Snail Eating where she's struck down by tick-borne encephalitis. And as she's recovering, she's given the gift of a snail, right? And she looks at the snail and forms a certain sort of cohabitation with it. And this interests her in the history of viruses as well. So in doing, in writing her illness narrative, she actually goes on to think about the complicated roles of viruses as well, right? So as I said, the common default tendency would be to think about the virus as some kind of invader, right? As some kind of super villain, so to speak, in some sense, that needs to be eliminated. Society must be defended in the Foucauldian sense from the virus, right? So there is definitely that tendency that we all think about. Whether we can say that about COVID or not, I'm not quite sure. But remember this, that when we talk of viruses, it's only very few viruses that come to the status of something like AIDS or COVID or so on. Again, if you are going away from human centrism, people like Just Van Loon have actually written about how, let's say, the HIV virus actually acts as a symbiont for, for large groups of animal, animal kingdoms and so on. Now, that's a different narrative to be written, so to speak, in some ways, where the human is no longer at the center of things. A different narrative could be written from the standpoint of, let's say, some, something like Azar, where the narrative principle is not so much about the human at the center, but how you can actually think about the virus itself as a prop to narrative. There's a Sudanese narrative, I keep forgetting the name, I was reading it just a few days ago, which actually takes the virus as the protagonist as well, right? Instead of thinking about the virus as the other that comes from outside, it thinks about the virus as subject, right? I think it opens up very interesting possibilities of how not only we live with each other, how not only how we live with others, but how we live on this planet as well. And I think this is the crucial dimension that we need to think about in terms of viral narratives. Whether COVID will get to that, I can't say. But I think there's, there are interesting possibilities of thinking about virals and virality in this moment as well. Thank you. Thank you, Rakhi ma'am and uh, Dr. Boisho for the fruitful interactive session. We are really benefited from this entire deliberation. Now, I request Aparna Goswami, Assistant Professor, Department of English, DK College, to offer the vote of thanks. Over to you, Aparna. Thank you, thank you, ma'am. Aparna. Yeah, am I audible, ma'am? Yeah. Huh. Thank you very much, ma'am, for giving me this privilege. On behalf of IQLC Dakshin Kamrup College, Mirza, Assam, I, Aparna Goswami, would like to extend my vote of thanks to all the dignitaries. First of all, I would like to thank our esteemed keynote speaker, Dr. Rakhi Kalita Maral Ma'am, for her wonderful keynote address. Madam, you delineated all the aspects of the topic in a very lucid manner. Your overview of literature on plague and pandemics all over the globe was very informative. Starting from Kasim and Atfut, it also included the indigenous examples of Mr. Dhrubajati Gogoi's work, Kala Azhar. Thank you very much for enlightening us with your learned words and also for addressing the questions asked during the interaction session. After this, I would like to thank our honorable resource person, Dr. Amit R. Baisha, sir, for his most captivating deliberation on plagues, pandemics, and literature. Sir, your deliberation was indeed very informative. You revealed to us different dimensions of plagues and pandemics, and especially the peculiar feature of literary imagination depicting them 
with an inherent notion that plagues come from elsewhere as well as the depiction of rumors associated with them the examples that you provided from daniel defoe's journal of plague year and albert camus plague enriched our understanding of the topic these examples with their details are aptly identical with the present situation of covid-19 and sir in your deliberation you also revealed the larger biomic view of the pandemic and their role in the symbiosis of the species uh, sir your post human stance gave the session a different dimension and thank you sir for the wonderful clips and it was really very engaging thank you once again then i would like to extend my vote of thanks to the respected principal of our college dr nabajyoti das sir it is due to his constant support and guidance that we all are encouraged to step on this virtual platform thank you sir for your valuable guidance then i offer my sincere thanks to our dynamic iqsc coordinator dr gargi chakraborty ma'am for arranging this intellectual feast for us at the same time i also thank the technical team of iqsc comprising mr manavendra kalita from the department of biotech hub and ms bonali kalita from the department of political science for their enthusiastic role in the webinar most importantly i would like to thank all our esteemed participants who have joined us on the online platform of this webinar we feel proud to see this overwhelming response from the participants who hail from different parts of the globe some are from usa some from nigeria philippines some from italy sri lanka pakistan uae bhutan and many others the thought provoking questions asked by the participants made the session lively and engaging thank you all once again there are several others who are behind the success of this webinar whose names i may have skipped by mistake and i thank all those who have been part and parcel of this endeavor now i would like to hand over to dr gargi chakraborty ma'am thank you aparna now um, we are coming to the end of this webinar i thank once again ma'am and dr boshyo for giving your valuable time and for uh, engaging ourselves in such great deliberation on the topic thank you once again everyone have a it was a pleasure nice time thank good you, night sir. and good morning for rahul thank you <laughs> thank you it is already morning for thank me. you thank you so much ma'am Thank All you. of you, learned resource persons. I am from Jharkhand, Sahibganj, India. Thank you. <laughs>